Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming this evening. We are very excited to have these amazing women here um, at the California Endowment. I am Constanza Svidler, and I um, curate these public programs um, for the California Endowment. We have uh, programs one um, every other month, sometimes more. So keep uh, keep your eyes out for our invitations. Uh, we want to continue the conversation with you, so please do come. Um, just a few little details. Please uh, put your phones on silent um, so that we can actually, you know, listen to our amazing speakers today. Also, we are live streaming today, so if you have to walk, please walk to the sides because our cameras are um, in the back. We like you, we just don't want to see your heads bopping through uh, the aisle. Um, also, all of you received um, some cards as you walked in. If you haven't received cards, you'll have a chance to get another card. Please write your questions in these cards. We want to try to get everybody's questions answered. So if you can do that, we'll come around uh, and collect them so that we can try to get as many questions answered as possible. Uh, and now I'm going to introduce Dr. Cynthia Tejas. Um, Dr. Tejas is a former um, board chair for the California Endowment. She was actually the board chair um, when we built this building and, and uh, inaugurated the building six years ago already. Um, she is a professor of psychiatry at UCLA, and she is also the founder and director of the, and I'm going to read this because it's a long title, the UCLA's Neuropsychiatry. Neuropsychiatric Institute, Spanish-speaking psychosocial, psychosocial clinic. Say that fast um, ten times. So, without uh, any long longer wait, please, Dr. Teyes, thank you so much. Well, good evening, everyone, and on behalf of the endowment, welcome to the Center for Healthy Communities. Uh, there's a saying in Spanish, bienvenidos a su casa, which is welcome to your home. Um, I've already been introduced, I won't go into who I am, but I am a former chair of the board of the California Endowment and was here when we built this uh, wonderful structure. Um, and for those of you who haven't been here before, the Center for Healthy Communities was what we envisioned kind of as a convening space. We could bring people together like yourselves. I'm so excited to see all of you here today because it's exactly what we were hoping to do, to bring wonderful people together who were leaders, who had great ideas, who wanted to help us and to partner with us in making, kind of implementing our vision of a healthier California, of healthier communities. <clears throat> So our thought was to bring together nonprofits, community representatives, and leaders in various sectors to dialogue, to share, to collaborate, and ultimately to figure out how together we could create healthier communities, particularly in the marginalized areas. We recognize that only together with all of you as partners could we really hope to become a catalyst for civic engagement and for social change. And I'm talking about the social change that really makes a difference, that expands access to health care, that increases health equity in all of our community, and particularly among the most marginalized among us. So really, we want to hear from you. We want to hear about your issues, about your solutions, your strategies, so that we can incorporate these and work together again to advance these great causes. Do these conversations, and I know that you have little cards to kind of write your questions, and maybe even afterwards we can continue being in touch with you and continue hearing about your ideas to make us aware how we can all together build a healthier California. So before I introduce our moderator, I wanted to underscore the importance of tonight's topic of Latinas and mental health. As, um, as I was introduced, um, you were, it was mentioned that I am director of a Spanish-speaking psychiatric clinic that's part of the UCLA Department of Psychiatry. I have been there for a very long time, before most of you were born, I'm sure. Uh, <coughs> over 30 years I've been working there in this clinic. <clears throat> and most of our patients there are kind of low-income, immigrant, unacculturated, Spanish-speaking, mostly Latinas. I see Lydia here somewhere who was, in fact, one of our trainees. <laughs> We've trained hundreds of people now, mental health professionals, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers that are now working all over the state and even outside of the state with, uh, with Latino populations. We're very proud of that. 
But what I wanted to mention here is that over the course of over 30 years, I've learned a lot of lessons. But one of the things that has been most striking to me and most impressive is the stories of survival and resilience of Latinas that have come to our clinic for one reason or the other. I have been incredibly impressed by their strength, their commitment to family, and their capacity for self-sacrifice. They are my heroines, without a doubt. And in spite of their courage and their tenacity, these immigrant women, who the data have shown are actually the most fit in their countries of origin in terms of having the strength to come over, are subjected to incredible stress and strain related to immigration, to acculturation, to language barriers, culture shock, not to speak of prejudice and discrimination, and the multitude of daily assaults of one kind or the other, mm -hmm. which have been referred to as microaggressions, but that over time really end up causing significant trauma. Okay. And not to speak of the grief that they inevitably go through in leaving their country of origin and all that's familiar in their families, their loved ones. There's always that sense of loss, usually, in an immigrant person here in this country. Mm -hmm. And so they come to us, oftentimes very strong women, but who at times have been maybe beaten down a bit, who become discouraged, who become demoralized. But within them, you sense this incredible strength. And that is what we tried to build on. And hopefully together we can figure out how we can do that. And in many respects, these women, Latinas, have become the backbone of our society. They pick our fruit and our vegetables. They cook at our restaurants. They clean our rooms. They take care of our children. And they are becoming the mothers of our dreamers, of the children who represent our hope for the future the children who will comprise the young workforce of tomorrow on whom we will all rely as we're getting a little older. They will be the scientists, the doctors, and the engineers of tomorrow. So it's in our collective best interest to pay attention to them, to make sure that we provide these girls and women with the opportunities and the support and the services that they deserve. So we're delighted, really, about tonight's conversation about Latina identity formation and mental health with a, with a kind of diverse panel. It's going to be very exciting. I was talking to the women here before uh, the convening, and I'm really looking forward to their comments. So I'm honored to introduce today our moderator, Maria Hinojosa. Um, very impressive uh, bio, by the way, and I will go through this right now. For 25 years, Maria Hinojosa has helped tell America's untold stories and brought to light unsung heroes in America and abroad. She's the first Latina to anchor a frontline report lost in detention about deportation and immigration. Hinojosa interviewed dozens of notable Latinos for Timothy Greenfield Sanders' The Latino List. As the anchor and managing editor of her own long-running weekly NPR show, Latino USA, and an anchor of the Emmy Award-winning talk show, Maria Hinojosa One-on-One, -on -one, Hinojosa has informed millions of Americans about the fast-growing group in our country. Previously a senior correspondent for NOW on PBS and currently a rotating anchor for Need to Know, Hinojosa has reported hundreds of important stories. She has won top honors in American journalism, including two Emmys, the Robert F. Kennedy Award for reporting on the disadvantaged, and the Edward Arbor Award for the Overseas Press Club for best documentary for her groundbreaking Child Brides Stolen Lives. In 2010, she was awarded an honorary doctorate of humane letters by DePaul University of Chicago and the Sidney Hillman Prize mm -hmm. honoring her social and economic justice reporting. Inohosa is the author of two books, including a motherhood memoir, Raising Raul, Adventures of Raising Myself and My Son. <laughs> she was born in Mexico City, raised in Chicago, received her BA from Barnard College. She lives with her husband, artist Herman Perez, and their son and daughter in Harlem, New York City. Please join me in welcoming all this wonderful panel. <laughs> I'm actually going to ask my panelists because we wanted to make this a little bit intimate, but you're so far away. That I'll come over. So let's get. Right. We're going to try not to drop anything since we were dropping things at the beginning. I'm going to lift up our chairs and kind of get a little bit closer to each other. Okay. Keep our dresses on. Keep our dresses on. Yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to move. Jenny, can you come a little bit well, closer? Well, you know, I think these here. chairs 
<laughs> there, there we go. We're working together. We're working it. There we go. Okay. They, they slide back. Um, but you can't really lean back like at oh, home and chat with you. Okay. But I'm ready. 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 I'm I have some comments um, that I'm going to share with you, kind of setting up the context. But let me go ahead and, and introduce the women who are with me on, on this stage. My old friend, Denise Chavez, who I haven't seen in a long time. And actually, when I was, was younger, and, um, <laughs> and I, was, I had not yet written a book, and then I, um, I wanted to write. And I really was struggling with this notion of how you write about what you know that is often our personal stories without hurting people. And Denise just said, you know, you just have to do it. You just have to write. You have to write what you have to write. E and trust us. And it was um, a, beautiful, a beautiful piece of, um, of respaldo to, um, to a younger writer. Um, and that's why I ended up writing my memoir, Raising Raul. Um, my favorite books uh, of Denise, I mean, all of them that I underlined, Love, Loving Pedro Infante, Face of an Angel, The Last of the Menu Girls. Can't wait to see her new book. I mean, she gets the best titles. The King and Queen of Comezon. Um, that's upcoming. Um, Denise um, runs um, the Border Book Festival, and she's been doing that. So along with being a cultural activist um, and being a writer, she has a book festival, and she lives in Las Cruces and is um, an amazing, amazing woman. And I'm really so very happy that she's here. And if you haven't read her books, please do, because they, they tell our stories. Um, and they are about many women who struggle with many issues, like all of us. So thank you, Denise. Um, also with us is Bianca Guzman. She um, has her PhD in ecological community psychology, which I've learned a lot about since reading her biography. She is a Chicano studies professor at Cal State Los Angeles, um, originally from Guatemala, and has a fascinating story about why she ends up studying and writing a lot about um, Latinas and our mental health and our attitudes toward, um, toward sex and sexuality. Um, in fact, she was given a grant by the California Department of Health to examine the sex behavior of ethnic youth, youth in particular, of Latinas. Um, she is the co-editor of a book published by NYU Press, Press entitled Latina Girls, Voices of Adolescent Health in the U.S. Um, and so thank you, um, Bianca. And what I have said to my panelists is that um, I really want this to be a conversation. Um, that's, this is not a topic that we often sit around and talk about, at least not in public oftentimes, in such a mixed audience. So I want this to be a real conversation, not so much a, you know, here's a question and give us an answer, but rather una platica. But let me just, as I was thinking about this panel, I was like, yeah, the hidden cost of the American dream. Hmm, I feel like I'm living that every single day of my life in the United States of America. You know, whether it's the most recent conversation with my husband who's from the Dominican Republic and just like, nos quedamos en este país o no? No nos quedamos. Are we staying or can we, you know, what's happening? You know, this whole notion of, of what do we do? What, what is this historical moment that we're facing and, and what as Latinos is the right thing to do to save ourselves, our families, our country, our future? Um, at the same time, in a very personal way, this dynamic of being Latino in the United States of America, I, again, I face it every single day, whether it's you know, dealing with questions of my father's Alzheimer's um, and the kind of the cultural impact that that is having and, and what that's doing to our family and, and to my mom, um, or whether it's you know, discussing my own reality of having two teenagers, um, you know, a boy and a girl, um, and what that's like to be dealing with adolescents in America. Um, to creating a new household where my husband and I share equal responsibility. If anything, he has more responsibility than, than even me, and so what does that do? And at the same time, you know, making a decision to create my own nonprofit because I felt like I needed to take control of, of my own voice and put my money where my mouth is and actually do this. Um, and at the same time, deal with the fact that oh my gosh, the Supreme Court just ratified SB 1070. Um, or, you know, living in a culture of suspicion where my son could be um, a young man under suspicion and stop and, you know, be a victim of stop and frisk in New York City, or I could be under suspicion when I go to Arizona and I realize that I must have my passport because my New York City driver's license is not going to be enough to keep me from being detained. 
or being in Phoenix and being in an underground library mm -hmm. in Phoenix. Um, what? Wow. <laughs> underground libraries and seeing as they were opening books, boxes of books, and the first books they were taking out were actually Sandra Cisneros and putting them on the shelves. And there were your books there too, Denise. Um, what? Underground libraries? Underground classrooms? Mm -hmm. And then going in and seeing Tent City, being with Sheriff Joe Arpaio in his Tent mm -hmm. City, which is one of the most shocking things I have ever seen in my life in the United States of America. And yet, being here, being a role model, you know, not giving up, you know, vamos adelante, you know, sin pelos en la lengua, si se puede, you know, I was with Dolores Huerta on Monday, you know, and there's Dolores saying, and by the way, tan linda, she was like, I just want to make it clear, I was the one who came up with si se puede. <laughs> <laughs> that was Dolores. She was like, so you know what, I'm owning it. 80 something, <laughs> all of that, <laughs> every single day. And you think you're the only one, <laughs> and you're not. We're all living it day in, day out. <laughs> so, um, sorry, that's a little loud. Um, so, <clears throat> vamos a empezar a platicar. Um, and, and I do want to make it personal. I mean, for me, in terms of my daughter, and I know you're the mom of two teenage who are sitting over there. Ay, Dios mío, ¿dónde andan? Ahí está. Levanten las manos. They don't want to. Oh, <laughs> oh they're, like, they're like, oh, no, mom, don't. This I is know. the most embarrassing moment ever okay, for them, I'm sure. Yes. Well, your mom, we're going to put your mom on the spot and make her reveal a couple of things. Um, let's start with you, Bianca. How, pues, tu hija sí, les va a tocar, escuchar. How did you resolve your Latina identity? Let's just start there, and then I'll ask you about your sexual identity in a little oh. bit. <laughs> in public. OK. Um, let's see. So how did I? I don't know that I've resolved. you're from Guatemala. I am Guatemala. from Guatemala. So I, um, I came to the United States when I was seven, and my mom's sitting over there, too. So <laughs> really, and my wow. husband, actually, I should say that because he knows no you know, because I didn't, I didn't mention him in the same group. Um, I love you, baby. <laughs> um, I came, uh, and we, we, you know, there's, there's a long story with that. We can get into that later. But um, I came into uh, Pico Union. I went to Hoover Street School. I lived off of 7th and Carantelet. Some of you are maybe familiar with that. We used to go to El Piojito, um, MacArthur Park. You know, my mother used to work at the Tienda de Guatemala during that time. Um, so I didn't realize I was with the Central Americans at that time, or maybe I, I was so young I didn't even realize which group of people I was with, right? Um, that I didn't realize that there was this whole other Mexican-American movement going on, not that far away. You know, the blowouts were happening. Uh, it wasn't that, I mean, they had just happened, but Cal State LA had just begun their Chicano Studies department not that long ago. Um, and I was oblivious in that enclave of uh, Centro Americanos who were afraid of the Mexicanos, pretty much, right? So the conversation in our communities <coughs> were the Mexicans are scary. Stay away from them. Se, se, se abusaban, <laughs> se abusaban. Yeah, well, it was like, like you know, in Centro, it, well, how many of you are from Centro America? So you probably understand like deeply the, uh, the conversation of Mexico being the powerful country in America, right? And so everybody's either afraid or wants to be like the Mexicanos. So, but I didn't understand that <laughs> then. So I think I've been struggling since then um, with who I am because I wrote this article and um, so this whole idea of calling myself a Chicana, I feel like... Um, when I grew up around that time with Gloria Romero being sort of my, um, my mentor, who was a state senator and now is doing some other stuff, um, who said to me, you can't call yourself Chicana because that's for Mexican Americans who have fought um, in the United States. And I thought, OK, um, yeah, all right. Well, maybe there's other people who didn't call themselves Mexican Americans but also fought. Um, so I always felt the, like I wasn't really in the Mexican club. Um, and <laughs> I, it was okay, because I was with Central Americans, so it didn't bother me too much until I 
leaped out to Cal State LA, which wasn't really far from where I lived, um, and realized there's a whole bunch of Mexicans, man. <laughs> there's, there's a whole bunch of them. And I'm going to have to be afraid for a lot of time because they're everywhere. Uh, <laughs> So and I met, so you can identify with white fear then. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> it's Mexican fear. I mean, if you're you're from how many of you are from Central America and can kind of relate to the idea that this is a whole group of other. We speak the same language. We kind of eat the same foods, but it's it's a different culture in a lot of. The things. thing that's that's standing out for me is the element of fear. Yes, yes. you know that yes. the element that, that there's a question of fear. So that, that let, yes. let's just let, yeah. let's pass it over yeah. to the. Well, I am going to make you an official Chicana tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bienvenida al club. <laughs> and you know that woman. You go back and you correct her because. <laughs> Being a Chicano or Chicana has to do with conciencia, the, the consciousness of la lucha. Mm -hmm. And not every, it's, it's a political consciousness that anybody can have. I realize now, growing up on la frontera entre El Paso, Las Cruces, Nuevo Mexico, that I existed in another world that was beyond the U.S. It was called El Polvo, Texas, where my people came from, the dust. And um, in that world, we were everything. We were the land, we were the sky. I never felt like I was an American to begin with. I was. Well, what did you call yourself? I was just uh, a person. I was a uh, Nuevo Mexicana, Tejana, but I didn't realize it. We lived in a, in a world that was so removed. If you know the Big Bend area of Texas, it, you live the land, the sky, the dust, the heat. I never felt that I was an American, so I never had the plague of being an American until later. But going back to your case, Bianca, por favor, get a hold of that woman because <laughs> to be a Chicano or Chicana is to have that political. Well, well let me ask you this, Denise. When did you, because you're saying, you know, I didn't, I wasn't an American. When did I become a so, Chicana? So, so when did you become a Chicana? Well, uh, during the movement, so when my cousin, uh, Antonio Luján was a brown beret and discussing uh, political issues with my mother when we were marching. Uh, it, was a, it was a political act on my part because I was in the drama department. I said, oh, I, I, what can I say? I was wearing wiglets and false eyelashes. And it was a political movement that released me to help me understand that, yes, there was a lot of racism in my town, a lot of uh, the Mexicanos lived on one side with the poor blacks on the other side. That street, Mesquite Street, that was, it was like the shanty town and, the, and La Pobreza was incredible. It wasn't until I be, was in high school and college that I realized that I was other. However, saying that, um, anybody can be a Chicano. I mean, and I, maybe I'm making a generalization. I find that more Mexicanos from Mexico are picking up the mantle of, uh, you know, before it was, I know, son Chicanos, oh, move away from them, they're dangerous. But now a lot of Mexicanos and from Mexico and other cultures, we can, um, you know, labels get in our way. And so I, I honor people's labels. If you're a Chicana, Mexicana, whatever you want to be, Gen Max. Somebody says that's the latest term here in California. <laughs> Gen Max. Well, I don't any Gen Maxers out there. I don't know. It's Gen Max. Come on, okay, Gen Max. But whatever you call yourself, don't let it get in your way. Don't let it get in your way because everybody has a very subjective thing. Um, you know, do you like red chile? Do you like chile colorado? Oh, I'm sorry, you know, whatever it takes. Some days I'm green, some days I'm red. Some days I'm Christmas. Some days you're orange, girl. Yeah, there's my orange. Well, here's the thing. I am sorry that we have to burden each other, Latinos, that we have to burden each other with labels. Let's do away with that. Yes, we have to remove ourselves. We are here as Latinos. Maybe that's the best term. Mm. The thing is, is that, um, thank you, we want to do away, you know, we want to do away with the labels. Maybe even, yeah, but even that. But the reality is, yes, the reality is. Our reality, everyone in this room understands that not too long ago, in the Supreme Court, it was right. right. And we all know, every single one of us knows, that at any time, 
at any place, anywhere, yes. not just in Arizona. We understand que nos pueden pedir por los papeles. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Anywhere. And that is our reality to bear. It is our cross to bear. Because our African American brothers and sisters have other burdens. And we share those burdens. And this is an added burden. And what do we do about that? I mean, to me, this is. Um, when, when that happened in the Supreme Court, I wrote, I wrote a column, I wrote something for, our, um, for Latino USA, <laughs> and my, my own editors were like, Híjole, Maria, you need to like, kind of tone it down. And I was like, why don't you know that? <laughs> because to me, it's like something so deep and profound has happened in our country. Expensive. And guess what? That happened, what, six weeks ago? Mm -hmm. But what's happening now in Anaheim? Mm -hmm. Or what happened last week in Missouri? How many of you know what happened last week in Missouri in the court case involving a, a Guatemalan baby? How many of you know? Raise your hands. Okay, you see not, oh, one person knows. Two people. Mm -hmm. OK, this is frightening. I'm going to say this, and then we'll, we'll throw it in, because it's going to be so depressing that, we, yeah, of course, we're going to talk about depression, because this is what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> no, and we can laugh now, but wait until you hear what happened. It's a mass depression. Yes. In a modern day America, in the year 2012, in a country where parental rights are, you know, defended, una mujer guatemalteca who was detained on the job two years ago, and because she was in detention and she had a six month old baby, and the baby was then declared to be an abandoned baby, and then was put into foster care, and then was given to a family, and the family adopted the baby without her consent, and they went to court, and the first judge said the baby goes back to their biological mother, and they went back to court, and last week, another court said the baby is now staying. He is no longer Carlitos, as he was named when he was born. He's been Jameson since he was six months old, and he was adopted by the Moser family, and he's staying with the Moser family. And the only reason why that has happened is because the mother is undocumented. So, dime, a ver, ¿cómo no vamos a estar deprimidos? Y como mujeres madres, dinos, ¿cómo no vamos a estar deprimidos? How are we not going to be like, you know, don't get me started because you don't want to see me break down just about right now, but tell me, Bianca, tell us. <laughs> well, I mean, you all know, you know, it's not a secret. I think um, <laughs> we are all depressed, right? It's a, supposedly we're out of the recession, right? We're doing better and people have jobs and you should all be going to the movies and you can buy your $5 mayonnaise jars now and, you know, all of this other good stuff. But, you know, we are living the reality. We see, um, it, that we don't have to go to Missouri, right? We see these kinds of things happening in the Los Angeles area all the time. Right, we don't have to go very far. So um, I think in general, um, we can get caught up in depression. You know, if you're sleeping too many hours, if you're not hanging out with your friends, if you're not doing your normal things, right, you're kind of getting the sense that um, this world is not worth living, then that's, some, that's depression, right? It's not a secret. Everybody, you can Google anything now, right? You can find out, you can be your own doctor, your own therapist, your own, ever, your own designer, you can you know, change your house, do all of that. But the bottom line is that um, I think that we cannot give up, right? Like this is my thing about everything that I write and that's the reason why I wrote Latina Girls is because I wrote that book because there was not the other side of Latinas. We only hear, I don't know if we can't have audience participation, I can't remember what the rules were, but um, if there was to be a poster child for Latina girls, what would it look like to you? So I'll answer for you since I think you are not going to answer. Um, <laughs> a pregnant teenager, a gang-banging girl, or maybe a, gang, a girl with a gang-banging boyfriend, or some sort of combination of all of that, right? Or a couple of children. So what, so even if that were the case, what, what's the other 50% doing? 
right? So if we say, or even if, let's say it's 75%, which those are not the numbers, um, there's another positive side, right? But we're never seen in that light. We're never seen as, um, how, how interested are we in science? How interested are we in computers? Um, what about are we happy? Does anybody ever ask if Latina girls are happy? Does nobody needs to know that? I mean, why is that not important? We are the next generation. So um, I wrote this paper recently, um, and it's been accepted for this publication called um, Developing a Guerrera Spirit. And that, and, and everybody is kind of kind of like with you, Maria, who's like, you're really out there with that Guerrera thing. And it sounds like, you know. You're too uh, angry. Yeah, you're too angry. You're Listen always up. too angry. You know, why, why are you so angry? You got a good job. Things are good. Why are you so angry? <laughs> you know, but, but I'm angry because the light in which we're seeing. And until that changes, and I don't know if it's going to be my time or my daughters are going to have to keep it going, I think we have to maintain that Guerrera spirit and there's ways that I think that we can do that but um, until we understand our collective power I think we can't move that far along but so. you know what then 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 what happens is that when you develop that Guerrera spirit we know we also understand that then we're seen like mm -hmm. so uppity mm -hmm. <sighs> what's the matter with that like why do they keep you know why do they keep pushing so I mean I mean, I, I love the collectivity of Guerreranes because then we can, you know, turn to each other. But there is that thing of like, you know, the response, which is, don't be so uppity and don't be such a Guerrera. Denise, um, you have written a lot about um, Latinas and, and depression and struggling and, and making it through. Why is that an important thing for you to, to touch on? What is it that you're trying in your writing? Well, um, I write about women's sexuality, and I write about women's lives. I grew up, I remember a woman asking me, uh, one of my last books is a taco testimony. This is dedicated to my mama Delfina and her beautiful tacos. Uh, but my mother had a body that was harnessed. She had very large breasts. People in the family made fun of her. She was always ridiculed by the tios and the primos and everybody. She wore girdles for many years. Uh, she was a teacher for 42 years, had the varicose veins to prove it. She reminded me of Luis uh, Rodriguez's mother and always running. I said, I know what that woman is like when it's those legs. Uh, I remember the scene where his mother is standing in a tinita and has a razor blade and releasing the tension of her legs, the blood. Uh, read that book because it reminded me of my mother's legs. So this. Uh, I'm coming around to your answer. The answer is that we need to be fierce because we have seen the struggle of our women and their bodies. And somebody asked me, you know, why do you write about women and breasts? Por favor. <laughs> My mother had these enormous, this body that was her undoing. And uh, she always had her little bra straps, siempre con su. Chanel number five is this huge bra that cut into her shoulder. She was in chronic pain. And then she would have Chanel aquí. She had just a little spot. This, this, despite the fact that the world made her into this body, she had that femininity, that beauty, that, that grace, that spirit. Um, we have turned our women into vehicles, into bodies. And we're more than our bodies. We are born, and I want to tell this to young Latinas. Uh, you come in here, you want to work in our Centro Cultural, you're a photographer, and you're coming to me con las chichis caidas and chortes, and you want to be a professional, and you are coming and presenting yourself to me as a professional, as someone. We have to get away from manipulating our bodies, women. My mother was manipulated by the harness. But our young women are manipula manipulated by, by the apparent freedom of bodies. And the freedom causes the pregnancy. I worked last year with a group of, uh, it was an arts program for teen parents. 
This is, you ask what the solution is to work with young people, to work with teens. There's so many chamaquitos, 12 years old, 15 years old, they're pregnant, they're on the way. We had art classes. Art, the thing is to art, to paint, to dance, to write, that is the solution. And to offer people solutions so that they see themselves more than a body. We are a spirit. We have souls. We have desires. We have dreams. And um, our, I see our young women so involved in their chichis. It's the chichiization of <laughs> the Americas. I am tired of that. Ah, por favor. You know, it's, it's interesting because um, <clears throat> when I um, why not when I talk with my daughter um, about these things. I actually, and I wonder whether, because I was born in Mexico, so mis papás no tenían esta realidad. It was really, there wasn't, I mean, my parents loved me, but they had no clue what I was experiencing growing up, trying to be an American. Mm -hmm. That was my dilemma. I wanted to be an American girl. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the difference now with my daughter, who's 14, is that um, we talk about everything, right? Because mi mamá no, pod no podía, mi mamá se casó a los 17, she got married at 17 with my dad, and they've been married for 50, you know, eight years. Um, so there was not, there was a lot of love, but there wasn't a lot of understanding of what I was having to manage and what I was having to do to manage my identity, which was that uh, I was me Mexican in the house, but outside trying to manage who I was in my community where there were not a lot of Mexicanos. And, um, and I've talked a lot about this when I've spoken particularly to young women, to young Latinas, about the peer pressure, the sexual peer pressure yes. of, you know, trying to be an American girl. So when I talk to Jurema, my daughter's name is actually Maria Jurema Guadalupe de los Indios Perez Hinojosa, but when I talk to Jurema, um, and I tell her, I'm like, Mamita, you know, the first boy that I kissed, I didn't want to kiss him. I was in sixth grade. I didn't want to kiss him. But all my friends said that that's what I had to do. And the second boy that I kissed, I didn't want to kiss him. But my friend said I needed, he needed to be my boyfriend because they needed to have me with a boyfriend so we could all have little boyfriends. I didn't like him, you know? The third boy, I didn't like. So when I say to her, I, I can, what is it like? I want your first kiss to be a kiss of desire. Mm -hmm. To be a kiss of desire. And I explained this to her. And, mm -hmm. you know, she came to me recently. I hope she's not watching this. Um, <laughs> and she was like, Mom, they were playing the bottle at the eighth grade graduation game party. And I played, and you know, so-and-so kissed me on the cheek, and I kissed him on the cheek. But when it got more serious, me fui. Because I didn't want my first kiss to be at spin the bottle. <laughs> and I was like. <laughs> <laughs> So how much, you know, this, this notion of talking, mm -hmm. I mean, share with us what, what you think we need to do, madre a hija, eh, to, to help us in this, in this process of, you're going to be beaten down as a Latina for all kinds of reasons, but you need to bring yourself up, and to talk, to have the, com the ability to have the conversation about things that are really hard to talk about. Yes, yes, and yes. So now this is where my daughters are, right? Oh, no, you're going to bring them up on stage? No. No, no, no. <laughs> are you kidding? They'll just <laughs> melt. <laughs> but, um, you know, so, uh, so my colleague Claudia, who's sitting in the audience, and I wrote a paper about desire. And so I'll answer the question that way. Um, and it was about Latina desire. But in general, if we talk about sexual desire is what we're talking about. Um, there isn't a whole lot of work out there about what sexual desire actually is, if you think about it. I mean, you pause for a moment. Think about what your sexual desire is. Maybe you have some more answers than we were able to get. 
But think of yourself as a 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, even early, what we're calling emerging adults, because they don't leave home anymore, right? So they keep emerging. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're emerging at your house uh, to about 26 or so. Um, and it was very disappointing to learn that most of our um, young girls, for sure, many of our young women and many of our adult <laughs> women have, well, for our adult women, many have not ever experienced an orgasm. Um, Are you saying you know this, that there's, that there's data about Latinas? Uh, very little about Latinas. You're saying in, in general, women. women. In general. So, I would so in over sexualized society where actually women are experiencing very little pleasure? Very little pleasure. Um, not only that, but beyond that, women not, are not able to identify what their pleasure is. So women cannot say what desire is for them. And for the young girls then, desire becomes what is sold to them. Right? So Nicki Minaj with her legs wide open and the lollipop, that's desire. Uh, it's usually desire for the male gaze, right? So male propaganda um, allows the young woman to have this belief, like you said, that this is her desire. This is what desire is for me. But is it your desire? Or is it the desire that's been forth, put forth for you? Right? And given all these circumstances, now I even forgot what your question was because I'd love to talk about this part. But um, <laughs> given this idea um, about how chained our young women are, in terms of who they are to our society. Mm -hmm. How do we move them, like how do we move them forward? Because they're, they're not going to leave this society, right? So they're still going to have to live within this society that tells them who they are over and over, tells them what their desire is, tells them what their beauty is, tells them when they should fall in love, tells them all this stuff. And then you go home to a more Latino home that tells them all the other stuff you're not supposed to do right, until you're married, you know, there's a whole conversation in Latino families about, well, why are you wearing a white dress? I mean, even in 2012, the conversation is like, mom, I'm 32. I've been <laughs> living with my boyfriend for a really long time, and, but you can't wear a white dress. So we're still having these conversations. How do, like, we thrive as women? I'm not saying I have the answer, but I think um, speaking with my own daughters and speaking with a lot of other mamas and mujeres, um, and taking a lot from the African-American uh, African community. Um, one of my colleagues wrote a great paper about um, the African-American community braiding young women's hairs and having conversations about being proud, about who your grandmother was, about who your people are. It's not the panacea, all solution, and this is going to fix it if you go home and talk to your daughter this way, because most of the time they want to be on the iPod or Instagramming or whatever else they're doing. But, but what I can tell you about from my own research is that they're listening. They're listening, reluctantly or otherwise. And they, and they may not take your advice now, but they will remember it later. Maybe when they need it. Maybe not. They're going to make stupid mistakes. We all make. How many of you have never made a stupid mistake? Well, I think the answer is to have options. Yeah. To be able to paint, to sing. Um, I've worked with Senoras Emigrantes from Mexico for many, many years. Uh, it's, it's, it's the fresh air to realize that you can paint. Just to get a, a brush or to do work a colored pencil. I was able to get uh, for our teen uh, workshoppers, the teen parents, uh, Prismacolor gave me thousands of dollars worth of colored pencils. They're very expensive. And I remember one of the little father's dads, he says, Miss Chavez, do we get to keep our pencils? Yes, you do. And, and when you work with teens or, or women, to it doesn't matter, Latino families, you not, work, you not only work with that person. You're working with the teen, you're working with the mom, the sobrinitos. The, what you're working with, when you work with a Latino, you work with the whole family. So I think uh, uh, that I, I would say that for me as an artist, it saved my life. Art does save lives. And I think that we need to have options for families, um, for young women, for children, for people to work together in creative ways that you see that there is hope, that there is life, that you can be something else, that you can create another reality for yourself. Now, we haven't touched upon this, but I, I do come from a background of, of abuse. And um, that was uh, very difficult to realize that, that our neighborhood had 
you know, we never talk about the high incidence of sexual abuse, whether it's emotional, physical, there's all kinds of abuse. And our women are shattered, many of them. And I think that art has a way of restructuring. And it's almost like your molecules are healed when you realize that you can write about something. But you have to be able to, I mean, to be able to write about it, you have to be able to at least acknowledge it. And that there's so much silence in our community. And speaking of silence, um, you all had cards where you were able to <laughs> write some questions. Um, and I think we're going to be able to collect the cards. Who are we giving the cards to? So people will be walking around collecting cards if you have them, and then they're going to bring them up. Um, I um, talk a little bit about depression and Latinas. I mean, there's so much that we want to talk about, but I do want to kind of hit on this because um, after September 11th, when I was living in New York and I was a CNN correspondent, which was a whole other battle that I was having of trying to be a Latina within the mainstream media and, and battling against someone like Lou Dobbs and executives who had named him to be there um, and holding myself back when I would see Lou Dobbs so that I wouldn't end up, so I wouldn't end up in prison. Um, and then after 9-11, there, and I had been to war zones, I've been to very dangerous places, but 9-11 because I was a mom of two young children. Mm -hmm. um, really impacted me and then I spent a year basically with victims of 9-11 for an entire year so I ended up having PTSD mm -hmm. and I didn't even realize I had PTSD um, and yet uh, I, I also couldn't let that debilitate me because I was a mom of two kids and I was working mm -hmm. but one thing that I ended up doing because I never saw myself being somebody and back 2001 really antidepressants were not as everywhere that they are now and I just was like, I'm ne I would never go on antidepressants. And I, I've always exercised, and it became a mantra. And, um, and so I, I don't think I battled depression per se, because I've never let it get that bad. But I do see what we're all living, oftentimes because of my work in kind of you know, highly um, charged realities. Mm -hmm. So being with women who were sexually assaulted when they were in detention and being their first, the first person that they're basically revealing this to, or being in the detention centers and seeing these horrific things. And if I, <clears throat> I don't want to start crying, so I'm not going to think about that for a minute, but it was horrific. Um, <laughs> and I, I exercise. I exercise. I exercise as often as I can in terms of every day um, because I've been doing it for so long. And, and then I, exercise, I try to exercise in nature. For me, la naturaleza is like one of the most curative things. So running, you know, and running through the park. And this summer, I kind of rediscovered biking. So I went out and I got a bike and I ride through Central Park. And my daughter gets very frustrated because I, I, um, I put on my music really loud and I literally scream and sing while I'm riding and, I, <laughs> and I'm dancing while I'm, and she's just like, oh God, I don't ever want to be seen with her, but I don't really care. Because it's my release, um, and it is my communion with with hope and um, and, and nature. So, um, how how do you battle depression? Depression. Get out of bed. That's the most important thing. If you are feeling depressed, do not lay down. And that is why I often get up at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, that's when the when they come to me, because I know that that is a magical electrical time between 3, 3 and 5. I often write between 3, 3.35, 5.37. I never linger in, I never linger in my sorrow, in my, my darkness. And I also realize that you need to give something to your community. Go out with the food bank, go out and help the gospel rescue mission, work with kids, adopt a little, a little brother, little sister, lo que sea, but give something back to your community and stay away but let me, wait, wait, from I'm the gonna, horizontal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you from, so how do you get up? You're saying don't, so I want you to tell me, Denise. Yes. yes. How do you get up? I get up because I have to get up. Yeah, I want you to tell other young women or women who are like, I've been there and I don't know how to get up. Well, um, I get up because I realize 
that if I lay there in bed, I might pass on. Uh, have you ever just think, if I'm going to lay here, I'm going to die? I'm depressed. I'm, I'm thinking about darkness. I'm thinking about things. I, I don't want to mull things over. I get up. I might wander around the house. I, uh, I'll, I'll read poetry. I'll go outside. It's beautiful at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's one of the most beautiful times of the day. I'll go to my computer and I write. I write for two or three hours. Me acuesto. And then, then the sleep comes on that's so delicious. You don't get frustrated, basically. <laughs> no. You basically don't allow yourself to get I, frustrated. Well, I have my moments, but I try not to. No, I, I move. Uh, I think it's important to keep your body moving. Like I'm not a, I walk. I'm a walker. Uh, and it's funny because lately I've been having trouble with my knee. But that's OK. I'm still walking through it. You get older, and you, you, your body begins to have a thing here, and a cosita, and you know what? Things happen. Um, but at the same time, you can walk through that. And you, because you have to, life is movement. And so we have to keep, so whenever I get up, I get up and I move around. Do, do you feel, um, one of the things that happens to me is that, um, I mean, everything that all of us are doing, it's hard. If you're putting yourself out there, hard to get up. it's really hard mm -hmm. to be taking on any number of challenges. And certainly mm -hmm. when you're in a public place, a public persona, it's really, really hard. But I, I, I feel like, I can't give up mm -hmm. because the historical weight of responsibility of what our country is facing right now is so deep and profound mm -hmm. um, that I feel like that weight. So I, you know, being the first Latina who was hired at NPR, first Latina at CNN, first Latina PBA, blah, 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 you know, I, I feel like if I had, um, if I was shouldering responsibility when I first started my career in 1985, mm -hmm. I feel like now I'm carrying boulders on my shoulder, be shoulders, because, because 25 years ago, we didn't have SB 1070. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so you know, I wanted to ask you to about, about the weight of being, yes. you know, Denise Chavez, who is a published author, who has, you know, you, know, you are, again, you are um, a literary icon. Well, I'm a community activist and an anarchist, too. I'm happy to say that. <laughs> I am an anarchist. However, uh, as for uh, just talking to you here now, I think you're shouldering too much. I think that you have to release the world and just take on a few people. Uh, I think that your, your path in future is to release some of what you are carrying right now and to take on a few causes, that one person, that, that person, because I myself take on too many things. Don't we all? Yeah. Yes. I mean, so we, we have to hey, learn to let go. You're telling me to give up? Yes. Something? No, I have. I actually have. I have given up a lot, and I'm going to give a lot more up because there comes that time, you know. But do you, and do you feel like, I mean, Bianca, you are, it seems like in your career, you're, you're going deeper. Mm -hmm. um, you're not pulling away. You're going mm -hmm. deeper into issues that very, very few academics are talking and writing about. Right. How are and you're a mom and you're this and you're you know your career, mm -hmm. you're not pulling back. No, you feel that. Yes, I'll so I'll uh, rest when I die is my motto. Yeah, uh, my <laughs> inbox will still be full. <laughs> so I don't know how I'll be in a couple of years, but um, I just feel like yes, I get depressed too, and so I do all of these. And sometimes depression is really sneaky. You don't know it's coming. Till it's on you, yeah. and then it's really hard. Can it's you tell us what that feels like for you. Um, when it's on you, what do you uh, mean? I get lazy. What what I consider lazy, right? Everybody has a different meaning of what lazy is. I don't want to wash the dishes. I'll let the dog do whatever it wants. <laughs> I won't cook anything. I'll. You know when I'm depressed, when I'm hiding out, I don't return. I'm constantly on email and on Facebook and on this and on that because I love hanging out with people. Mm -hmm. So if I don't respond to you within a couple of hours, you're like, oh, she's, she's, you know, she's hiding out. Mm -hmm. Something's wrong. And so like, for those of you who don't, may not know, that's, that's my depression time. And I also get up 
from three to five. I saw my husband smiling. But um, three to five, and then I'll like go back to sleep, and then I don't want to. Then my kids think I'm just lazy because I get up later. But anyway, so um, so I do a couple of things. Here's one of the things that I do to get myself. Maybe it worked for you. Um, I have this thing where I will get something for free today, whatever it is, whether it's a cup of coffee, I'll get the parking, whatever it is. That makes like my day happy. So I, I'm going to get something for free, and usually I do. You know, usually, and sometimes it's big, you know, like dinner or movie tickets or whatever, or a hundred dollars on the floor, because uh, that that's big, you know. Um, and then I do this other thing where it's like a pay it forward thing. Um, my friends and I will go out and we'll pick a table or a place or whatever, and we buy the food for that table or we buy the groceries for that. Mm -hmm. So we just so that makes it happen. This is my own like personal stuff, right? For depression for myself. So you give back to I the community. Back. And and I do. I also also do this because I'm always a no. You come no. Like, I'm, I'm already a no. You haven't even really asked me, but I'm always like a no. Yeah. But it's not real, because I always say yes. So <laughs> if you ask me enough. So some days I do the, I'll say yes to whatever. Today I'm going to be a yes. And then I have the days where I unplug. So that's what, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know, my family can probably tell you more. But that, that's what works for me. You know, what were we, we were, um, were we just talking about this in the green room where we were talking about how, um, you know, this notion of, of again, the, the, the weight, because um, los Latinos ahorita somos tan criticados por todas cosas. And at the same time, you know, we really are the future of this country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What we decide, um, values, morals, um, the core of who we are as a country, really, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add a little bit more weight to you all. <laughs> it is. It is on your shoulders, in fact. It is on our shoulders. Mm -hmm. So we have to find a way to balance, you know, the, the, the blues, mm -hmm. right, with the fact that we have this incredible responsibility. Mm -hmm. And it is um, a deep responsibility to Latinos across the board. I'm, I'm doing a, a, a report, I'm doing a profile that's going to run on Latino USA and on NPR. Um, and it's about the mo a profile of the most powerful and influential Latino you've never heard of. And I'm not going to tell you who he is, so you can all find me on Facebook and Twitter, and then you'll know when I'm going to do it. But the point of the story is he's actually a Republican. He's very active in the Republican Party. And he just said um, that, that there, he was like, it's a moment when all hands are on deck. Every single Latino, all hands on deck. And... And to hear him, he's you know sixty something years old, and yet he feels like all of us have this all hands on deck duty. And yet, a lot of the questions, um, you know, one of them, you know, what is the importance of self worth as a woman, um, and and especially when you have so many women who don't have a sense of self worth. Um, as Latinas, you know, is there, you know, should, should we be having a particular conversation with ourselves about our self-worth? Can we have that conversation with ourselves? What, what is that conversation? Well, the conversation is between mother and daughter, uh, between yourself when you look in the mirror. Um, you mean like basically me? like kind of talking to yourself? Oh, yes. Because, I love that. Okay, so then there are some women who talk to themselves. I'm one of those people. I'm like, yeah, you can do this. Yes, you can do it. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, we talk to ourselves. Yes, you can do it. It's all right. Um, we have these tapes that we every day. My father had Alzheimer's for 15 years, and so I know what it is to give somebody his tape. You are Ernesto E. Chavez. Today is. Uh, this is the month of. And um, it was like I would have to feed him his tape. Um, we have our tapes that we play to ourselves, too. And, and my, my tapes are positive, energetic. Uh, I try to keep myself lifted up in spirit. I think, you, I think we, you have to have a core of godness in you. You have to have God, whatever your spiritual path is, 
Uh, and I think that's what we need to impart, not religion, but spirituality to our people. That, that no matter what happens, no matter, it's like the Buddhist Gatha, the saying that I know that when I'm here in Los Angeles, that I carry my mountains from Las Cruces with me. So I am mountain solid. Wherever I go, I am mountain solid. I know my feet reach to the end of the earth, and wherever I stand, I am solid. So I know who I am, where I come from, who my people, people are. I know where I'm going, and I might be lost or confused, but I get out of that bed and I remember my antepasados. I remember all the people that came before, and I remember the lessons that my mother taught me. And I remember when she also came up to tell me, she said, Denise, if you ever get pregnant, don't give up the baby. Wow. That was coming from a Catolica Misa every day. Uh, that was a great blessing, and it freed me. I never, I have not had children um, because I had my dad. He was, he was. I, I did banyal duty for many years, and uh, and I married late, and that was my path. But I knew who I was. I knew where I came from. I knew who my people were, and I knew where I stood. And so even today, I don't care for flying, but I'm here because well, that mountain goes, solid. That goes interestingly into this into this question, which basically is, how is identi identity um, classification different for second and third generation Latinos and Latinas? What are the struggles that these Latinos have to go through to assimilate it to marketed classifications, um, both within the American and the motherland culture? And how does this contribute to, um, to depression and sense of self, right? So now we're going to have this whole, like, well, you're not Latino enough, you know, um, <laughs> right? Um, I interviewed, um, oh. for the Latino list number two, um, I interviewed John Seda, who some of you may know, He's um, he played uh, Selena's oh. love interest in the movie and was in Homicide and uh, a couple other things. And he, you know, he's just like, look, I'm a Latino, Puerto Rican from New Jersey, and I didn't, I don't speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, and that's who I am. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the first, one of the first auditions he went on, the directors who thought he was you know, getting Latino actually said to him, can you go get a tan? Oh and he was like, sure, I can go get a tan. Yeah, yeah. And then he went out in the sun, and he was like, why am I doing this? <laughs> oh, because I'm not brown enough. So what, what about that, the second and third generation Latinas, um, who, as we know, also um, carry depression? Mm -hmm. We do know, all of you do know, that Latina teenagers have the highest rate of attempted suicide in the mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. So, and that actually, that statistic has been around for over 25, 30 years, if I'm not, 30, 35, maybe even 40 years. And yet we're just beginning to talk about it. So what about the second and third generation Latinas and their own issues of identity? Can you comment? Because I find that to be an interesting question. I think they, you know, whoever wrote the question probably already has the answer, but uh, that's usually how it works. But um, I don't even think you have to be a second generation, but think about it. You know, like my daughter, so I'm the 1.5, right, because I got here when I was seven. So my daughters are second generation. What kinds of depression do they face or what kinds of issues do they face? So if you look at my daughters, I have one that's darker skin and one that's lighter skin. And we talk about this all the time, right, because even though in this society we understand that we have African in us, we have Asian in us, we have, but there's this idea that you can't look a certain way. So that in and of itself, you know, if you look at me, I, you know, I hear ladies sometimes talking about me in Spanish in the bathroom, you know, say, saying stuff. I'm like, boy, duh, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not going to embarrass you to tell you that, right? <laughs> so my life has always been one of you're not, you're too light skin. And so then, you know, I have kids who have different, we're a rainbow of color. And so when I'm with my darker skin daughter, everybody's always like, oh, she's your daughter. Oh, right? So how, how does she deal with that, right? Because that's going to be an ongoing theme when her friends come to my house. Oh, that's your mom? Oh, right? But there's like all this stuff, right? All this psychological stuff that's going on. And that's, and we're only talking about skin, the pigmentation, right? So, you know, even beyond that, you know, how does she place in um, AP classes? How do you get into Bernard? And how do you get, you know, I'm going through this with my daughter who's not going to be applying to college, right? And we just made a list, right? And we said, you must apply to these schools. 
and then you can do whatever else you want. But <laughs> so you know how it sounds did she like very much of an American family. Yes, but so dealing with all of that plus all the you know the racial tensions and all of that again you know I mean I, I'm not offering solutions but you have to go home and like Denise says find your mountain is that what you said find, well, find your, your solidity, your solidity. Your strength I right. love so, that so um um so when we were talking at the beginning of the conversation and sexuality came up I have to say that um it started to sound also a little respect a little prudish you know and I was wondering, like, mm, and so there were two questions about that, which is, how do you make the open-minded, principled woman more attractive to young girls? So open-minded, you know, mm -hmm. and principled. Um, I like that. But at the same time, somebody else wrote, given the discourse of Latinas and sexuality, how can you support Latina lesbians and integrate them into this conversation? Mm -hmm. So um, well, I think everybody has to take their own path. It's respect, Becht. It's how you want to call yourself, how you want to be. As long as there is dignity and respect among people, I don't think you're going to have those questions. Uh, you know, we, I come from people that have, no one in our family has ever committed suicide. We're more likely to kill someone. <laughs> <laughs> we are killers. killers. Um, That's a better, yeah. better road. <laughs> it is, it, you know. <laughs> So, uh, as far as a good laugh, <laughs> and, and as far as sexuality goes, I think whatever works for you, uh, whatever is is appropriate, and there are many paths in this world. I, I approach every road as a road, and and I think that if we can give each other dignity, respect, cariño, uh, support each other. Um, What's the problem? What is the problem now? What is the problem? Why can't, why can't we live in peace? Why are we killing people? Why are, our why are we sending our I mean, children to kill people? Look at what just happened. People? Look what just happened in Colorado, right? I mean, I know. Why? Like, this is our happening? society. This is our society, and it is our society. It is. Um, I love this question. At which point is being a guerrera too much? Never. Is it, is it when the people, person she's fighting against, yield, fight back, become the abused or oppressed? Wait, what was that? In other words, well, you know, at which point, uh, let's just stick with that. Which point is it is being a guerrera too much? Well, um, I don't think. I don't think it's ever, ever enough, no. given where we are. Right. Or as Sandra, you know, Sandra Cisneros now has this, um, when I interviewed her for the Latino list, mm -hmm. um, she went into this discourse about, and I want to be una chingona. Yeah. Yeah. And now she's she's come up with 12 easy steps to being a chingona, and she's writing a book about <laughs> this, you know, and so it's all about, um, there, there is, you know, that, that ability to also, to not let it be too much. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's never too much. I think that we as a culture are too nice. Although here you have another question. Oh, Do we as nice? Latinos, gl Latinas os glorify self-sacrifice of Latinas? Oh, absolutely. And is this detrimental? Yeah. Well, that oh, self-sacrifice yes. thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ay, que sacrificio, Dios mío. Yeah. From our Catholic upbringing. So, I, uh, so look, I think we're way nice. Even when we're mean, we're way too nice. <laughs> so I, you know, because when I think I'm being mean and people just say, oh, you were just express, not always, right? <laughs> There's other words that are used as well. But I think in general, we are too nice. And I think when yes. you're- Mothers are too nice for yeah. son. Your son comes in from the bar, it's two, three in the morning. I'm mijo, mijo. What can I fix you to eat? <laughs> you know, excuse me. <laughs> There's the whole gang of all these borrachos out there, and the mom is cooking for them. Yes, we are too nice. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we've been nice for too long. Time to get tough. Looks like some chingonas are happening on stage. Hell yeah. Um, can you comment on the stigma in the Latino community against anti-depression drugs? The stigma oh. against anti-depression drugs. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't answer that because I've, I've never taken any. I don't have an experience of that. Well, let's take it well, to this place. Let's take let let's talk about um, you know seeing therapy therapists. 
Um, I mean, I am, oh, yeah, I see what I am very about. happy to reveal that we did family therapy in my family. So this would have been 1970s when um, um, my mom, who married my dad when she was 17, and my dad is a medical doctor. He, you know, had four kids, and mi mamá limpiaba la casa, and that was she was what she was dedicated to. And then all of a sudden, she was like, "I'm ready to do something else," mm -hmm. and um, she went to work. Um, and then there was this created a huge issue in our family. You know, the meals weren't ready when my dad came home. There was a sense of like, you know, what is my mom doing, rebelling, and that ended up actually doing leading us to family therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have been doing therapy on and off. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to say that because I think it's important that within the Latino community, you know, we talk about this. Mm -hmm. So what about the stigma of, vas a ir a ver un terapista porque estás loco? Estás loquero. ¿Te volviste, volviste loca o qué pasó? I mean, do any of you, have you still to this day, if you have heard that, raise your hand. Yikes. Well. Oh my God. You know, we weren't people that had therapy. When my father was a teenager, there were a bunch of kids that went to the river and many of them drowned. And he, my, I remember my dad, this was the days before therapy. Your father locked himself in his room. Uh, he never came out. This was my aunt, actually, and my mother talked about it too. He never had therapy and he became an alcoholic at age 14. And that's the kind of, he could have used therapy, but there was no one to give therapy at that time. You know, you talk about medicating. Uh, it's not so much the, the drugs, it's the alcohol that is our problem that leads to, for Chicanos, Latinos, this is the bane of our existence. I, I cannot tolerate. Uh, so true. Um, you know what I happened? Can, I, 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 that, is, that is it. Alcohol. I met this adorable student graduate from UCLA, Chicano Mexicano, mm -hmm. who said to me, he's like six feet tall, he said, yeah, I graduated a year ago, but um, I'm recuperating because in January I fell off of a five-story building. And I'm like, and I'm like, ¿qué te pasó? I said, because I'm a journalist, I ask anybody anything. I was like, were you depressed? Yes. <laughs> I was like, were you, because I'm, I'm, I'm yes. fascinated with the issue yes. of depression. I said, were you depressed? He was like, no. I said, were you high? He was like, no, but I was drunk. Wow. Drunk, drunk, drunk. Y mal paso, and he just happened to land standing up. So broke oh his, both gosh. of his ankles and fractured. Oh my gosh. Um, el alcohol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that is a form of self-medicating. And, and it's another form also. of suicide, too. That's, we, we can't kill ourselves in other ways, so we drink, we, whatever we do, too many, too many chicharrones, I don't know, whatever it is. Yeah. We kill ourselves in other ways, and I love chicharrones, I'm sorry. Thank <laughs> God we have Denise here, but I'm so sorry, right? folks. So so they're they're making us laugh. Laugh. But going back to the, the medication question, I think that recently more younger Latina girls who are not able to, for some reason, they don't feel like they can cope with, with coming to college, right? Being the first mm -hmm. generation college students, they're now taking the happy pill, which is you know one of these um, antidepressant drugs. So I hear a lot more young women now who are taking the happy pill. We and talk about that, that prescribed on college campuses. Well, I don't think we. I don't know about our our campus. Um, I, other um, health centers on campuses might be prescribing drugs, but I mean that's what's getting. Uh, is that a good thing? Is, is is I mean there's a balance, right? If if there is a chemical imbalance and you take a pill and it's going to make you feel better, then that's good. On the other hand, there and there is you know. You know, could you possibly try to um, to deal with this yourself, whether it's through exercise or meditation, or am I being completely, you know, um, naive mm -hmm. because I've never experienced that kind of just debilitating depression? Well, some. I mean, I had one student one time and one time in one of my classes who I didn't realize how depressed and. Um, she had to do a presentation, and she fell apart right before the presentation. I mean, fell apart, like mm -hmm. fell apart. Um, and I just thought, you know, this is an entry level, lower division <laughs> class. This should not be happening to a nice young woman, no matter what, right? But who knows what other things were going on? So I 
think, you know, I, I'm not for Western medicine. I try not to participate in Western medicine. I think there's many other ways that you can do it. But I think when the young women grow up in this consumerism culture, in this American culture that tells you more is better, quicker, right? Because in Latino communities, we also do the suero, right? We just want to shop for everything, right? Your, your family members, right? Like, just give me a shot of the B12 and I'm going to be yeah, good, that's right? True. That's big in the Latino community, right? Yeah, that's right. So, so I, I think that, um, I don't know whether the happy pill is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I watch the commercials just like you do, and I hear the side, you know, like, I, I'm going to poop on myself. I'm, all these things are going to happen if I take this pill. So, like, what, you know, I'm going to have leg tremors. And so I, I think, or I'm going to kill, you know, I'm become a killer family. So, uh, no, I'm not saying you're a yes, killer family. We, we <laughs> could be. No, 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 I don't want Denise as, a, as an enemy at the end of this. Uh, <laughs> she might kill me. No. I would not. No. no, and I would not because I have made that choice. Yeah. I think we have. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, but I think it's <laughs> all the time. There are choices. <laughs> but there was a time. This no, really there serious, are choices. This is a very serious question um, that's actually really sad. Um, and there's questions here. How about those young Latinas who have no mother in their life? So hold on to that. Um, Sexual violence, rape, causes severe depression. How do we start talking about sexual violence? And many Latinas are living, living in the state of auto mourning as a result of trauma. How do we address trauma as a community? Um, well, I think discussions like this, I think you could have just one discussion on trauma, uh, sexual trauma. I think that would be very valuable. Um, but if it's more than just a platica, I think it's a series of workshops. Let's paint, let's dance, let's move, let's be together for a weekend in which we address some of the issues and the deep core things. Let's lay down on the floor, let's exercise, let's do whatever it is. It's a, a concerted effort of people coming together uh, with a cause and, and working on things. Um, you're not alone. Even if you don't have a mother, there are women who are like mothers. You have mentors, you have hermanas, abuelitas, tias, lo que sea, whoever's out there. Uh, find, put yourself in a community where you can find somebody that will, will be there for you. The, the mothers will be there for you if you present yourself as a child. And you will become someone's mother, and at some point you are the child too, you're the mother, the child, we exchange roles. But I think you have to put yourself uh, in a place where you're open to, to finding somebody that will help you. You're not alone. No one is ever, ever alone. Uh, and you, it's just a matter of looking over and finding that person that is there for you, I think. Although, I don't know. You want, you want to disagree? Huh? Well, I feel like, no, 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 la verdad, la verdad, you know, with my dad with Alzheimer's, um, you know, I actually am at a place where I think part of where my kind of existential oomph is that, no, actually we are, we are profound, profoundly alone. Yes, we are. We are profoundly, uh, profoundly alone. Having said that, yes. were it not for a small group of compañeras mm -hmm. um, that I can call on in whatever moment, my mentors and my, I would not be able to be where I am. Mm -hmm. um, so. I understand the existentialness of estamos solos, solos en el mundo, you know, and I, I think back, and you guys will correct me because I'm confused whether it was the Mayans or the Aztecs who said la vida es un sufrir constante, was it the Aztecs or the Mayans, or was it both? Híjoles, porque los mexicanos, pues, mm -hmm. a sufrir. Chicano studies, people? Yeah, hello. <laughs> um, so, you know, and that's kind of been my lemma, you know. Es que, that's, es que, well, when, 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 cuando la vida, you know, when life is giving you something joyous or pleasurable, date cuenta mm -hmm. what a gift it is, what a gift Well, you know, is. I think we move through that transition. Yes, you have those mothers and the mentors, but ultimately we are facing the unknown, which is eternity. And if you believe in a world of eternity, of constant reformation and, uh, I don't see it as a darkness. I see it as a light. So if you if you want to move, eventually the friends, okay, yes, Maria, everybody disappears. 
uh, okay, let's accept that. But what does exist is that eternal creative mm -hmm. becoming. Okay. Well, legacy, no, mamita, I mean legacy in some well, way. I mean, meaning you yes, perhaps, but you know, after a while, I, I'm not interested in fame. I don't care about a legacy. Uh, as a writer who's, you know, your, our books, they go up, they go down, they're here, they're, what really does matter when it comes down to it? And your dad, your mom, we love these people, yes, but there's something bigger. I, I, have, I have to believe that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so things pass, people pass, everything passes. Huh, huh. Um. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Uh, <clears throat> one of the most common reasons for not reporting incidents of domestic violence is fear uh, of the partners of the police. Are there any alternatives to reporting these incidents without having to get the police involved? Um, and this is clearly dealing with somebody who has um, a family or someone known who is undocumented. Um, this, is, this is what our America has become today, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did this happen? But it's true. Now we have domestic violence counselors who have had to say to victims, mm -hmm. you have to think twice about calling the police because you could lose everything at that point. I do not know how to resolve this. I think this is, again, one of these deep places where our society, like with the Missouri baby, um, you know, Carlitos Jameson, um, where we don't, we don't know. Um, I also think, you know, um, we actually did, Latino USA did a town hall on Alzheimer's mm -hmm. um, in Chicago, in the barrio. And my mom and dad came. My mom was on the, the panel. And my dad was in the audience. And um, it was a very emotional thing, because it was kind of the first time that I was revealing that my own family was dealing with this. And when they handed me the mic <clears throat> to start talking, olvídate, empecé a llorar, and it was like, <laughs> and I couldn't talk for like, I just realized it's you, Jerry. I can't <laughs> believe it. I could, a friend who I haven't seen in a bazillion years. Um, I, I couldn't talk. And, and everybody was freaking out. They were like, <clears throat> what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And the fact that I was crying and crying and crying allowed everybody in that room the freedom to cry. Mm -hmm. And I just went to see because my therapist, actually, who I'd seen on and off for 20 years, on and off, went into therapy and stopped practicing. So I'm seeing her therapist. Um, so it was my first time seeing a psychiatrist um, last week. Beautiful young Latino psychiatrist, um, fully bilingual. Y empecé a llorar. Entré. And I'm so embarrassed. And he's, and he's like, it's OK. Llorar es bueno. And I was like, no, it's not. But it is, too. Um, and I'm surprised, actually, that we haven't cried on stage. But I feel like, um, I feel like so many of us, and, and I find this in my work reporting, that when I actually take the time to look at somebody in their eyes mm -hmm. and ask the question with real intent, and oftentimes, most often with men, empiezan a llorar. Mm -hmm. And it's almost because our, we feel so invisible in so many ways, mm -hmm. that being asked the question with genuine interest um, can, can bring on tears. So what about the importance of crying, mm -hmm. of shedding te tears, whether privately or in public? Um, well, is I that think, important? Yes. Well, <laughs> you, you know, a couple of my students are here, so they can tell you. Um, the first year that I started teaching at Cal State, I had a class that was really challenging. And um, I cried quite frequently. And my husband would always say to me, don't cry. You know, don't let them see you cry. But I think it's important. As a matter of fact, um, I also endorse pity parties. So, uh, <laughs> because I don't, I don't What do they look like? They look bad. Are they up? They're we're bad. Not. No, we're not. No bra. You know, we're in. You know, there's none of that going on. No underwear. underwear. You know, we're, we're, we're down. You know, we got um, I mean, whatever it is you enjoy. Personally, Doritos and hummus and ice cream and chocolate and almonds with uh, 
fault. I mean, you know, you know, and, and but the thing for me is I've learned over the years that um, it's got to be time because I could do this forever. Right? It's not a good thing. So I, I think it's a good idea that we also need to acknowledge, right? This uh, this the certain that sadness that we that. live yes. with. So it's okay. How about pick? Call all your friends. Tell them I'm in a pity party. Don't call me. You know, let tell on yourself. I'm having this because people really. People want to love you. People want to serve you, right? And I don't, I don't want to cry now, but no, no, no. Um, I think um, <laughs> like human. And then you know, wait, wait, wait. Why did that? Why? Why? What brought that on? Because I see the people here, and I see your humanity, right? And um, I think we're here to serve ourselves, everybody, right? Not not ourselves, but. Um, in the end, all these questions that you're asking are about how can I share my humanity with you? I agree with that. I think that's the ultimate okay, question. Okay, thank you, buddy. <laughs> uh, hey, Maria, you, the both of you, I think that is the ultimate question. Are we here to serve or to be served? And I think we, and you, that, that's one of the ultimate questions. Is it light or is it dark? And that is a deep question. And that changes all the time, too. Um, the devil exists. Evil exists. We know that. And you have to make that choice every single day. You have to make that choice. Am I here to serve or to be served? And how will I do this? I, if, I, if I don't cry for a certain amount of time, I know I'm not well. <laughs> Just, and so I have to do, I have a self-gaging a uh, barometer of tears, and um, I know when I'm healthy. And um, I cried a lot this weekend because one of my friends passed, and I didn't realize how deeply I was going to mourn one of our volunteers at our Casa Camino Real Cultural Center. He was a man that would come in Sunday afternoons to help me evaluate books and records, and he lived in Bolivia. I was married to Boliviana. He was, lived in Africa. He was a volunteer, and I did not realize how deeply I loved him. Um, um, I've been told that we have one last question, but of course I have um, a couple. So I'm going to read them um, because I want to be respectful for everybody who took the time to write. I, I like this question. Religion? Question mark? Impact on Latinas. Oh. Huge. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Huge. Um, I like this one. Denise Chavez, talk more about how you found the arts, or did the arts find you? You like that? Wait, wait, wait. Ah. Um, can you talk more about technology and mental health of our youth? Really huge. That is huge. Um, especially where technology can be liberating or at the same time really yeah. scary. And, and for a lot of Latinos who are on identity issues, especially if you're undocumented, I find that technology can be really liberating, right? You can be anyone you want and you can soar without, with or without papers. Um, also, how do we educate our parents about <laughs> our youth's identity? Um, referring to the use of labels, there was a general agreement about a lack of need of, or use or their use. However, how can we encourage an inclusion of differences, phenotype, sexuality, notion of origin, without using labels. And finally, society blames the individual for the position that a Latina is in, young, pregnant, depressed, poor. How do we engage these disadvantaged women <coughs> in participating in the restructuring, um, the cause of their position when they are hopeless um, and when they don't have resources? I know that one of the things that I, that I do um, and, and I think you're so right, Bianca, in the sense of what made this so emotional, because I think so many of us deal with invisibility and feeling invisible, um, because, because we are, you know? I mean, you know, just in every possible way, we're, we're very visible, and yet we're still invisible. Um, but one of the things that I do is I just try to look at people and, and honor them when I see them. Mm. And um, mm -hmm. from, you know, from the taxi driver oh, yeah. um, to la señora que trabaja conmigo y que cocina and, and oh. feeds me and my family. Um, and I find American heroism 
in all of these people. Um, there was a young woman who um, I went, uh, I met. She was um, in one of those big box stores. And she had, <clears throat> she was wrapping up the thing that I had bought. And she had a really interesting tattoo here. This is in East Harlem in New York City. And, uh, and it looked like it was Hebrew and Arabic. And I was like, Hebrew and Arabic tattoo, what, you know. And I said, well, what's up with the tattoo? What does it mean? She says, the, the meaning is karma is a dog. Get it? Um, and I was like, huh? And she was like, it's in Hebrew, it's in Hebrew and Her Arabic. And I was like, what? She was like, I have a friend who speaks both. And that's why, I, and I was like, well, why is it there? She said, because una sola vez me levantó la mano, the father of my child, one time, one time. And I called the police. Mm -hmm. And my family didn't want me to call the police because they live in a cycle of violence and I was just going to be part of that. And I called the police and they came and I haven't seen him and I will never see him again. And this tattoo is to remind me to never, ever, ever forget that one time. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked at her, she's 22 years old, and I was like, you are an American hero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're an American hero. And I took her hands and I was like, and she of course was like, esta loca esta señora. <laughs> but I wanted her to understand that the strength and power that that action took was extraordinary. And I find that American heroism, and I mean American Americano, you know, the Norte Sur, mm. to be something really profound and to be able to honor people by looking at them. You know, and saying that because I think that we all are dealing with this dual or multiple reality of being Latino and American in America, mm -hmm. and the messages are mixed. We have to wrap it up. You want to give some final thoughts, Denise? What was the, que the question about creativity? Well, they what just want to know about you. They're like, no. Uh, when I was eight years old. Um, my mother went outside, and our neighbor was pulling off the branches of a willow tree, sauce llorón that we had in the, in the yard. And she said, uh, Billy, he was a mentally unstable teenager, what are you doing? He says, I am killing your tree. And he did. Uh, but that tree meant so much to me. If you've ever loved a tree, that was my first short story that I wrote when I was eight years old, was about the tree that was so beautiful, beautiful that was killed. And I think it's important to write those stories, to dance, to sing, to laugh, to create, because how do you remember a tree? I, I wrote that story when I was eight. I wrote it when I was 24. And I still have that stump of that tree in my backyard. Uh, there's a trilogy of stories. That tree is still with me. So I would say to people, just keep dancing, keep singing, wake up, get up, get out of bed. Three o'clock is a great time. <laughs> and so just keep working it. Bianca. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I couldn't even keep up with all those questions, but um, uh, words of wisdom or something to end this, right? Um, what can I say to you? I work with teenagers all, all the time. And so the thing that I can tell you is be as positive as you can be. I know there's cynics and critics and all kinds of things mm -hmm. out here in the audience. Well, they didn't talk about this, and she didn't say this, and I know she wasn't going to say that. But in the end, I mean, you know, it, it's Denise's point, too, is find your happy spot and be happy. You know, find a time. You know, if you have to make an appointment with happiness for yourself, <laughs> oh, then find that because oh, the like world that. is coming at you. So you want to stop that. You want to have the world respond to you rather than you getting the bat, right, and going, OK, today, whatever comes at me, I'm coming. I'm coming, right? But what a world could you have if you pre-think your day? How is it going to go? Wow. And then at the end of the day, even if it didn't go the way you wanted it, you rethink it because your brain, your neurons fire the same way as though you were um, attending the event. So just make it up. This is the other thing. I lie, right? Not in a bad way. Now you're going to think everything I said was a lie. But you know what I mean? Your world is your world. You get to say. So make up how that day should have gone for yourself. And then go to sleep. And I would just leave it with um, my, two, my two favorite monikers are, this I learned from my husband, tienes que aprender a comerte el miedo. 
You have to learn how to eat your fear mm -hmm. so that your fear never becomes unstoppable. You eat it. Mm -hmm. And I literally go <laughs> And my latest moniker, because we are all battling this, was I came up with it. It's FOP. Focus on the positive. FOP. Thank you so much. This is beautiful. Thank you so much for this concept. And thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. FOP. I remember that. That's great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you. Gracias. Thank so you. I heard a what after FOP, so just to reiterate, it's focus on the positive. So please do that. Um, you know, I, we've been wanting to have a conversation like tonight's for a long time. I feel so privileged to have these three women on stage to be fearless about talking about these topics that we don't talk about. I think um, and to be able to Oops. laugh at it and make jokes about it and make us all laugh and cry and, and really take the topic so seriously um, because it really does deserve this conversation and many, many more. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I just want to uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, and the thing that I am carrying with me tonight is that you know, we're resilient. There's a resilience in the Latino community um, and these women, women and all of you for coming tonight and on all the people who do what they have to do to take care of themselves, whether it's reporting domestic violence, whether it's taking care of themselves, however they know how, however they can because of their circumstances, there is resilience. And in continuing to talk about these topics in open forums and to really get our young people to learn that there are options, that there are other realities that they, they should and be able to imagine, uh, and it's up to us to teach them to imagine those realities. Um, so I take that with me, and I hope that you take that with you. And I was gonna, of course, segue with where are my South Americans at, because I love my Mexicans and my Centroamericanas, but where are my South Americans at? Am I alone here? Thank you. <laughs> Two more, three, four. Okay, I'm not alone. Um, so, uh, like I mentioned earlier, that we do host these conversations the other month or a little more often. Our next program will be September 19th. You'll get more information about that. It's on alternative transportation, focusing on bikes and how to build a better LA. Um, so keep your uh, well, emails tuned for that invitation, which will come soon. And uh, also, before you go, there were so many more questions. I know that um, Maria tried to read all of them. There were m many more, so stay. There's whole fruit outside. We got rid of the cookies because it's too much sugar for uh, late in the evening. But stay, talk. Um, I believe our speakers will hang out for a little bit. Um, but thank you so much for coming. And I hope to see you again. Good night. <laughs>